Welcome, welcome to everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here on the Ignite stage to talk about the funding landscape. As he just said, my name is Alyssa Cohn. I'm an executive coach and I'm the author of From Startup to Grown Up. My passion is helping startups grow up and I think we have an incredible panel to help us with that today, talking specifically about the funding landscape, um, you know, sort of worldwide and certainly here in Ireland. So I'm going to ask you all, Danica, to start with you, to ask you to kind of just give you a little background about you and about your organization, and then we'll go one by one. Cool, thanks, Elisa. So my name is uh, Danica Connell, and uh, Elisa made sure we were going to be short on this, so I'm I definitely going to be short. So my name is Danica. I head up the uh, tech team in Enterprise Ireland Startup. Um, we look after all of the software startups uh, that come out of Ireland every year. So Enterprise Ireland is a government agency. Our job is to grow startups, and our job is the same. Our job is to grow startups from startup to scale up, and we do that across any sector that's going to that's going to grow out of Ireland. And our, our interest in is exports and jobs in Ireland. Amazing, fantastic, Dennis. How about you? Yeah, my name is Brian Garrity. Hi, I'm a, a principal in the Clara Capital Partners team. So I joined Clara at the start of the year. Uh, before that, I was at Silicon Valley Bank for uh, over eight years. And so I've been in the space um, for, for a long time now. At Clara, we're a venture debt fund. So we fund technology and life science businesses um, from two to 60 million size tickets all across Europe. So, and a little bit in Singapore. Uh, we business markets are probably London, Berlin and, and Dublin, um, and yeah, looking forward to talking a bit more about it. Fantastic, and now Dennis, you. Yeah, thanks Elisa. My name is Dennis Ryan. I work in AIB technology sector team, so uh, similar to what the guys said there, I, I look after those types of tech high growth companies uh, within the bank, uh, making sure they have access to, I suppose, traditional banking products, services. Uh, so the bank has a sector team uh, that covers all the main sectors across the Irish economy. So I got brought into the bank at the end of last year uh, because I worked in a tech company for six years before that covering kind of software development, product build. So my industry knowledge, I try to kind of help uh, the kind of frontline access more complex transactions and your, your normal banking products and services. Beautiful, so as you can see, we have a diverse set of experiences here that really overlay the overall funding ecosystem. And Danica, I'm going to start with you. The funding environment, to say the least, has changed quite a bit over the past year, really. Can you give us the current state of play and how you see the funding environment? Yeah, and, and we would have said that, so the, the market has come down and people have gotten more jumpy around how these things are going to be funded and, did, did, we, did we have a bubble in tech or whatever? And I suppose from an Irish context, and I'll speak mainly from an Irish context, obviously globally we see, it, we see a tech slowdown and, and in Europe and in, and in the States. But in an Irish context, we, we like to say we didn't lose the run of ourselves on the way up, mm -hmm. so we don't have as far to come on the way down. And when I see what we're seeing, what the kind of startups that we were seeing in the ecosystem, and we fund our startups the same as any other ecosystem, it's nearly always equity at the start, from angels or venture funds, and then they grow into venture debt and into senior debt. Um, we haven't seen, we've seen it, people kind of pause, but fundamentally, the valuations that we have never really got as frothy as say London or New York, and there wasn't pools and pools and pools of capital chasing very few deals. So from our perspective, it's going to be, yes, it's going to be slightly different because every VC or every Every angel is going to say, oh, we're going to have a conversation about valuation. But I genuinely think, and when I look at the pipeline from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, so we would like to think, and we know that we are the first port to call for many companies and startups that genuinely have an ambition to scale. And when we look, and I see a couple of my colleagues from our, from our HBSU Ops team or our inquiries team, and they tell me that the pipeline is still healthy and is still robust. So we're still seeing the same number of people coming in the top. And then when I see it come to my stage where we put the first kind of proper funding into them, we're, we're seeing a bit of a slowdown, but it's not, it's not a huge thing. So fundamentally, good companies still have plenty of options in terms of how they get funded. Yeah, that's so important, sort of yeah. the quality aspect of it. Now, Brian, 
You know, we talk a lot in the U.S. certainly about venture capital, and that's really the thing that people focus on. When would a company want to think about raising venture debt, especially in this landscape? Yeah, so look, we're less, much less diluted than equity, right? Um, so uh, you're giving away less of your business uh, as a first instance if you're raising money. Mm -hmm. In this market where valuations are suppressed and coming down, we sort of kicked that valuation can down the road. So if you raise venture debt from us today, we'll give you another six or 12 months runway to get, you know, usually it's to get from an A round to a B round, B round to a C round, much more now it's to get to profitability. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, it sort of gives the company, allows them to continue growing on the current trajectory, gets them to the next milestone at a proof point, whether that's better equity markets in 12 months time or to profitability uh, or to a sale or, or whatever they're trying to do. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of companies at the moment, we're probably closing three deals a month. So venture debt is very much uh, in fashion at the moment because of where the equity markets are. Yeah. Um, and so outside of funding pure sort of growth or runway extension, we're doing a lot of M&A as well. So we have loss making businesses, buying profitable businesses, uh, digitalization of those businesses, and M&A is a good use for venture debt as well. Yeah, I think it's such an important point you're making that really the emphasis has been in the past about growth, and now the emphasis is much more on profitability for all companies around the ecosystem. Dennis, what does a great banking relationship look like? You know, I know that this is something also that companies may come to you, it might be too early. How do you think about kind of the life cycle of a great banking relationship, or what does that look like that people should know about? Yeah, kind of similar to what the guys touched on, um, I suppose the earlier you commence a relationship with, with your customer, with, with the bank, the better. So a lot of the time in the early days while you're figuring out your product market fit, you may have taken on some seed funding or equity funding. Uh, it's it's kind of keeping an open dialogue with your bank, keeping them, you know, um, up to date in the milestones. So if you're looking to, I suppose, scale the business, close a Series A, and take on staff, it's it's having a regular uh, dialogue with your with your local branch or your RM, depending on on what stage you are in the growth cycle, and then I suppose you know, when you are interacting with the bank and you're at a stage where you can take on debt capital, it, it's kind of helping the bank to understand what's unique about your tech, why will your tech still be here in three, three years' time or five years' time, and look, the, the bank is not an expert in technology, they just want to get comfortable that your technology, your business plan is sustainable, viable, and achievable. So that's a two-way relationship. So that's what kind of good looks like when it comes to a traditional debt capital deal into, in, into, with, with, with your bank. That's very well said. Are there other areas that you sort of add value above and beyond funding to the, the clients you serve? Yeah, like Elisa, a lot of the time uh, companies will either uh, they, they come to us too early for in the, in the growth cycle or they don't come at all. They get so far without bank debt and then they kind of go, well, look, we've gotten here without it. Uh, but there's a huge array of other banking products and services. So a lot of Irish tech companies are going to try scale into the UK quite quickly. So managing the global treasury side of the business. So a lot of founders are going to be time poor. They want to automate and abstract that complexity away as much as possible. And then there's kind of your um, protecting, you know, the key people within the business uh, as you take on funding, the board changes, dynamic, you want to protect uh, the founders, keep the key talent. Uh, and then as you kind of move through the growth cycle, you're kind of tapping, a lot of the time I would be joining the dots for the tech companies, tapping them into the relevant area within the bank, whether it's corporate finance or our colleagues in good bodies, or it is more complex kind of working capital arrangements that they need, like invoice discounting. So a lot of the time it's helping them navigate, uh, helping them navigate what can be a complex uh, yeah. organization. Yeah, a real tapestry there. Danica, were you going to say something before? Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think uh, Dennis, the point is that uh, sometimes you think you could be on these panels and people assume there's a linear progression of people. They'll talk to the equity providers and then they'll talk to the venture debt providers and then they'll talk to the senior debt providers. But the, the question is, as an entrepreneur and a CEO, your journey is your journey. Mm -hmm. And yes, that a lot of people end up going that particular route from equity through to debt. But for a bunch of companies, it might be straight debt. But you don't know until you have the conversation. So you need to constantly be trying to work out and talking to people before you need money. So there's no point if you absolutely need the money 
and then go to the bank thinking you're going to get X and Y and you're not profitable and never being profitable, that's just not a conversation that's going to end well. So you need to understand what the options are, how do you grow this business, how do you talk to people, and, and if you talk from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, we would argue that we were the original accelerator. Mm -hmm. So we provided capital for companies, and we had our 25th anniversary in this, this room two months ago, and one of the things was that we provided capital all the way, but we also provide value-added services in terms of the connections, and Dennis said it perfectly, is joining the dots. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what the next thing the company needs. I see a couple of my team here, we're doing some great stuff, say, in our sports tech team, where we have a bunch of sports tech companies, We've been engaging with some of the, the sports organizations around in Ireland, and they've attracted, say, international rugby to Ireland, and we can kind of showcase, look, and these are all of the companies that we have in sports tech. Uh, we can, we've created a kind of a sandbox environment where those companies can play with these bigger organizations. Those companies would never have gotten to speak to those organizations had it not been for the work that we did on the ground in terms of we're seen as a safe pair of hands. We're not trying to sell to the sports agencies. Um, and similarly, when we're talking to banks, it's very hard for an Irish software company or cybersecurity company to get into the Royal Bank of Canada. When the government of Ireland turns up, they know we don't have a vested agenda. We're not trying to sell you something. We're trying to understand what your needs are. And then we'll introduce the companies, but the, com the, the, the buyers on the other side feel a bit, bit, bit less threatened. That yeah. I'm, I'm, not trying to, I'm not being sold something here. Somebody is genuinely trying to understand what my needs are. So, as I said, we, we would consider ourselves the original accelerator. Now, uh, now we've got our, our investment goes with so many other things as well. Yeah, and I would suggest that probably the three of you have a real tapestry of connections and sort of joining the dots potential. Brian, I'm going to go to you in a second, but I also want to remind everybody that we're going to take Q&A from you all from the audience. So, I think it's to put the Q&A into the app, is that right? into the app, yeah, and then we'll, we'll be uh, fed your questions from the audience. Brian, what kinds of milestones and how do you think about whether a company is ready for what you have to offer? What's your diligence process like and what yeah, are the so milestones Yeah, so typically um, on the tech side, you know, like debt is, it's not for survival, it's for growth. You need to be growing, um, otherwise you're going to get in a whole mess of problems taking on debt and, and not growing and you shouldn't be getting it in that scenario. So. As you said earlier, like it's all about efficiency now and profitability, and so companies are actually more lendable in a way because they're burning less. You've got a, uh, you know, maybe it's a less aggressive plan, but it's a bit more conservative. Um, we sort of lend to companies that are, you know, Series A plus, probably five million revenues plus on on the, on the tech side. They've got product market fit, they've got pricing power. People are buying their products, um, and then when you look at unit economics, depending on what industry it is, if it's a consumer business. You know, it would have to be CM3 profitable. If it's software, again, it's sort of how much dollars are you spending to get those dollars of revenue? And that's obviously changing in this environment. Yeah, that's great. That's a very sort of specific milestones that everybody should be thinking about in your own drive for profitability. You know, Danica, when we were speaking backstage in the green room, you talked about how Ireland has a superpower with connectivity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I think that's uh, one, of the, one of the things that when we sit down together and when we look at the Irish ecosystem, so. As I said, a company's path is not linear, so you, you need to be able to figure out how to navigate your way through, and I genuinely think, I think that Ireland has, I'm not saying other people don't have it, but we just do it really, really well, is that we can connect each other up in, in a heartbeat. Everything from like, the fact that we could just very easily chat about the journey of funding, and we all know, and we all know the companies that we're talking about and how one company can move from X to Y to Z, all the way from the basic research that's carried out into universities into spinning that research out into the, some of the accelerators. I saw DC from NDRC earlier, into the regional hubs, and again, that's super important from our perspective, the, the guys from the iHub are here as well. All of those bits self-reinforce, mm -hmm. uh, and it's only when you see them all working together, you kind of go, actually, that really reinforces well. And they weren't all there day one, but we've made a conscious effort as a state to join the dots up and to say, well, okay, we've got this research coming out of uh, our basic universities, and my team is looking after startups, and they're not getting to me, well, let's put a commercialization team in between. So there's, there's a thing that we're super proud of here called the Commercialization Fund, and that's job is to spin that tech out of university into startups. So we could, I, 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 and I said it to you, this to you upstairs, I genuinely think if I needed to get the leader of the country, the Taoiseach, in a room in about five days, if it was needed, we could do it. And I think 
there's not many other country and startup ecosystems that can genuinely claim to have, I can get you everyone you need in the room if, if needs be in, in really short term. So you can get stuff, and, and we, we kind of, the Irish, the other than the Irish, way of doing is slagging ourselves off and kind of saying, well, we're not good at X and Y. But let's be really proud of that. Let's be really proud of that connectivity that we have. And people will say, I don't know, but I can put you in contact with someone. And I think that's, don't underestimate that in, in an Irish context and then as we go globally as well. Absolutely, so important. Dennis, can you talk about the way you intersect, not just with sort of lending products, but you know, in the rest of the ecosystem in terms of how you deal with equity, how you have other kind of tentacles around? Yeah, we, we would overlap, um, and it's kind of following on what Donica said in terms of uh, introductions, you know, where it, we, we don't operate within a silo, within the banking side. So we would, uh, we, we have over 400 million uh, deployed across, uh, across over 440 companies. So the AIB equity unit would uh, actively go out and invest uh, as a funder of the funds role. And that opens up everything what Donica alluded to there. So we have very strong, active relationships with over nine different PE houses and VC funds. So sometimes what, one thing I would say is where an entity approaches the bank and they, they're just not suitable at this stage of their growth journey for bank debt. Um, you know, there, there is an array of other funding options out there and we are open to kind of introducing them. And it's like Danica said, in, in Ireland, we're extremely well networked. Everyone kind of with, within a phone call or an email could, could give you a relationship, an introduction. So don't be shy on asking your bank for, look, is there any other way you could help? Any soft introduction you could do for me? That's great, super helpful. And again, I'm going to invite you all to put, submit questions through the app. And I'm assuming that someone's going to send me, bring me a, an iPad to take those Q&A. Danica, I'm going to ask you about sort of ESG and diversity, and then I'm going to come to you and ask you these same questions. You know, there's been a big mandate from sort of the, the whole world to focus more on sustainability, on diversity, on in, in inclusion. How have you thought about that? And what have you changed in terms of the way you inculcate those important topics into the areas that you look at? Yeah, and that's interesting because again, I would have said that Enterprise Ireland was the original impact investor because we never invest solely for financial gain. We're, we're, our job is to develop the Irish industry. Our job is to develop innovative companies in an Irish context, not not only in Dublin but across across the country. So that has to be that that brings that sustainability to it to the fore to say we shouldn't all be commuting into Dublin. And it's only it's in recent times that it's just become more common. And, and so we are comfortable in terms of understanding that not everything we do has a bottom line. And it has to have a double or triple bottom line. And that the two big pillars for us going forward, or three big pillars are going to be regional development. It's going to be diversity. And, and diversity, not just for diversity's sake, but genuinely we see that diverse teams make better decisions. Better decisions lead to better companies. Better companies lead to better outcomes. And it becomes a circular reinforcing piece. So we would have always promoted and, uh, and, and diversity in, a sim in, a, in, a, in a, the, the way in which it's manifested most easily at the moment is through female entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. that females are an underrepresented, when we look at the cohort of companies, the look at the amount of investment that goes into female-led businesses, the number of programs and the number of startups that we see, it's much, much less. So Enterprise Ireland, well, maybe five or six years ago, began to really focus. Starting point is you measure it you say, how many companies do we have? And we started, and we were as bad or as good as anyone else, and it was six, 7% of all of the startups that we funded were, were female-led or had a female on the team. And now we look last year, we did 160 uh, equity investments, and I think the number is 37, 38% are female-led. It's not where we need to be, but it's, it, it's improving, and we continuously improve and look on it. We have a, 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 a women in business strategy, which again is trying to bring that, not a spotlight, but to say, this is the way we do business. This is the looking for diverse teams and making sure when we ask the question, so all of our VC funds ask the question of potential uh, VCs that want investment from us, what's your diversity strategy? Do you have an ESG policy in place? And if you don't, when are you going to put it in? Similarly, sustainability, I think sustainability is, is if this is going to sound stupid, but it's here to stay. We cannot look, we cannot not look through the lens of sustainability, and I think one of the things that really reinforced it to me was even through the pandemic, 
when we were speaking to the European Union about stuff that we could do and not do to help businesses when they really needed it, it always was. The green agenda did not slip down. Mm -hmm. It was there front and center. So we are beginning to understand and, and beginning to look, look at everything that we do through the lens of, is this sustainable? Will, will this end up in a sustainable business? Not in terms of term, tons of carbon and stuff like that, but sustainability and diversity are, are, are not just tons of carbon, but they're how we do our business and is it sustainable. It is not going away and we just need to get used to saying, it just, it's gonna be a lens, it's gonna be an additional ask, it's gonna take us time and it's gonna be an additional consideration that we have to make. But when we look at the, all of the policies and where our funding is coming from, where the policy objectives are coming from, we just need to keep sustainability to the fore. Now, once you look at sustainability, it is a huge thing. It, is, it, is it the number of startups that you have in a particular phase? Is it the, is it the data center access they have? All of these things come into it. So it is a huge elephant to eat, but we need to kind of, again, let's start measuring it. Let's start seeing how many companies. We're seeing an increase in number of companies that have what I'm calling climate tech, but that can be everything from we talked earlier about cows and methane all the way up to people doing blockchain measurement of carbon trading and stuff like that. So, so again, it's here to stay, both diversity, um, sustainability, and I think regional development are, are going to be our three pillars. And they are part of our strategy and, and will be part of everything that we do. Great, thank you, that's really helpful. Because I just want to, before we get to the Q&A, I want to ask you if you have anything else to add from your perspectives around sort of sustainability, inclusion, or diversity from the points of view of your organization. Yeah, so look, uh, echoing Donica's points, we're, we're back, our LPs are ISAF, you know, EIF, British Business Bank, they will all look at funds through that lens of, of what they're doing from ESG, diversity, sustainability, um, we look at it like when we're doing our credit memos as well, and we recently backed Grid Beyond, which is an Irish company which helps with, uh, you know, officially managing excess electricity in the grid, which hopefully is lower prices for, for everyone. So um, it's something that's definitely front and center of what, of what we're doing from an investment standpoint. That's great. So one of the questions I have here is from, you know, a founder who doesn't know even where to get started. Um, Brian, let me start with you. If there's this, you know, sort of, I don't even know where to get started with it for, for, to think about funding or fundraising, how would you give them advice to navigate inside of the uh, ecosystem? Dennis. Na navigate the... Navigate inside of the, den the, the ecosystem in terms of like, I don't even know where to get started. What would I do first to think about how do I position myself for funding? How do I get ready for the process, what should I be mindful of, what should I look for, those yeah. kinds of questions. Look, I, I, I suppose there's never been uh, a better time to start <laughs> in terms of you know, state agency support with Enterprise Ireland, you have tons of accelerators, uh, Porter Shed run, and Dogpatch Lab run accelerators, there's tons of support in the likes of your local enterprise office. So a lot of people I would see would focus on the monetary support, but equally powerful is the kind of commercial support and the kind of the advisory, the mentor, mentoring. So there's tons of support out there that you can tap into. Uh, and then, yeah, look, when you're building out your product, try bootstrap and get as far as you can, uh, you know, leveraging friends, family, You'd be surprised how many technologists are in large, big four tech companies, and they, they will be quite open to do some additional dev on the side to help you out. So that's what I see as good looking like. Uh, so yeah, leverage your network, tap into the state agencies, and when the time is right and you've got your business as far as you can, then you start looking at the funding mix, uh, you know, which we've all alluded to here. Yeah, I really appreciate that you said that. I mean, the whole notion of sort of being strategic and intentional and also getting as far as you can without having to go to traditional resources I think is so important. Um, Danica, there's a question around how does uh, your organization help startups? You know, you can't necessarily build a unicorn only in Ireland, right? So we want to be able to find other ways to approach other markets. What resources do you have to help startups and companies find their partners and do business in other countries? Um, yeah, can I answer the, the yeah, other sure, question please. first as well? I just because I think it's important to say, in terms of, there is so much in the Irish ecosystem. But in terms of starting a company in Ireland, a obviously talk to Enterprise Ireland. But there's so many other things going on. Our new Frontiers program, the local enterprise office. These are great places to start the conversation. 
talk, talk to other founders. You're ultimately going to have to spend a lot of time asking questions, and the best people to ask are people on the same journey. Uh, and one last thing is NDRC and Dogpatch are running currently a specific program that's designed to, to help founders meet other founders. So their whole program is they're trying to match tech founders with domain experts, and I think that's a great place to start. Going back to the overseas office piece, the jewel, one of the jewels in the crown from Enterprise Ireland and the value we add is our 40 overseas offices. Mm -hmm. So we've got offices all over the world whose only job is to help you get into that market. They will, they will understand the types of companies in that market, be it the banks or be it, be it some of the insurance companies or whoever that you are trying to sell. They will try and have that relationship. Now, that's, that makes it sound as if everyone can go overseas day one. Not everyone can go overseas day one or not everyone can hit 27. We have so many people come to us and say, I want to hit 27 markets because that's just the, the, the market I'm trying to hit. Hopefully, you will get an Enterprise Ireland DA will say, A, you don't have enough money. B, you're going to waste our team's time because you're going to be spread too thinly. It is difficult to go overseas. So our job is to push them overseas, but it doesn't mean it's, any, it's easy. It is difficult to, to, to learn the cultural norms of that country, to learn how business is done, because it's not necessarily done the same way. We see an awful lot of Irish companies go to the UK first, but we, we've been diversifying away from that. It's still a hugely important market for us, but we're seeing a huge increase in Eurozone. Uh, we're seeing a big increase in the States. Um, the States is a far away place that costs money to get to, so there's, there's just lots of different ways. So we can help, but we can help you when you're ready. And I think that's an important piece. We're not gonna let you simply trot around the world because it's a cool thing to do. <laughs> that's gonna be a waste your money and you get as a startup, you get a couple of shots at this, you get a, a chunk of change from different investors, but if you don't hit the milestones, it's, you run out of options, and that's the piece that Enterprise Ireland should be helping with, the development advisor that you're working, which be saying, I'm gonna help, help you talk to our German office, or I'm gonna help you talk to our US office, but let's talk to them before we go move anywhere else. So I think that's a really, really important piece. Yeah, uh, just just I could ask, the, I, I previously worked in a, an Enterprise Ireland supported tech company, and one of the big value adds, as I was selling tech into, you know, the, you know, the UK or, or other markets, uh, the East Coast, uh, the Enterprise Ireland offices were extremely helpful. And that's an intangible value add that is underappreciated. If you're selling tech internationally, you know, leverage EI, leverage every support that is available to you. So I'd echo what Beautiful. Danica said there. That's great. Brian, you in your career have seen lots of founders, right, in various different elements. Can you sort of capture and maybe give us the idea of what makes a great founder? When you're meeting with a founder at first, you're like saying, oh, this is going to be a great founder. What are some of the elements and qualities that come to mind? Yeah, look, there's founders come in all shapes and sizes, right? And I think uh, you'll have the main expertise. You'll have people who have gone into an industry and don't know much about it, but realize they can completely disrupt it from maybe experience elsewhere. At the very start of when you're out raising and you're coming to look for, uh, for funding, it's, you know, a lot of it's about the story as well. So a lot of it is, unfortunately, about the pitch and the conversation. And um, we're a little bit further on than, say, Seed or um, uh, in terms of funding. So when you're coming to us, you know, it's a business plan. It's what are you going to spend your money on? Um, but it's also their experience. You know, will uh, we like a second time founder because they've done it before, right? You know, everyone wants that. You can't get it all the time. Um, and so I think it's someone who, who knows the space. Uh, like, I'm a generalist, so I'm not going to know more than they will. And so if they're coming and, and they've got a real uh, uh, authenticity and they understand the space and they understand the problem they're solving, which they do because they've seen a niche for it, then that's sort of when you leave the meeting and you're kind of like, you know, they know what they're doing, they know what they're talking about, and, you know, we, we love to try and back them. Yeah, for sure. I have to say most of my clients at some point they sort of make big mistakes and then we all realize that's why VCs and, and funders like a second time founder, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You get that experience. Last question, super quick, super quick. One sentence, best advice for anyone right now navigating this funding environment. Right, I'm going to start with you, Dennis, and uh, one sentence of advice that you have for anyone navigating this um, funding environment. Yeah, I'll speak uh, with, with purely from a bank lens because the guys are covered off equity and venture. So when, when you're approaching the bank, you know, put a, as much effort into your cash flow projections as possible. The banker, look, you know, it's the lowest uh, cost capital in the market. 
so we our risk appetite is low. So we want to make sure your cash flows are tight, they're on the money, they make sense, and we'll drill in underneath the science behind those cash flows. So when you're ready to approach the bank, put your effort into that. Beautiful. Thanks, Dennis. Brian? Yeah, well, the model is actually pretty important to me as well. <laughs> but I, I would say that, uh, look, if you have to raise, you have to raise, right? So if that's going to be at a valuation that you don't want, um, but you need the money, you, you need to have to do it. And, you know, good companies are still raising money. They're not raising money at prices from 2021, but, you know, my house won't be worth what I paid for it today in three years' time, or it wasn't worth what it was five years' time, right? So the market is the market, and I think, um, I think if you need to raise, you probably just need to, you know, take that um, lower valuation, but, you know, keep building the company and keep scaling. Excellent, Brian. Danica. Surprise, surprise. Brian. The people giving out the money said, you're going to have to take low valuation, but that's a separate <laughs> thing. EI kicks the can down the road. We don't do valuations day one. <laughs> but the fundamentals are... Yeah. Good businesses will still get funded, and a good business is around the team, the opportunity, and, and, and can, you articulate the op can you articulate how much resources you're going to require to get there. So those fundamentals haven't changed, never will, and I think we just need to really focus on team, market, and, and do you have the resources. Excellent, thank you so much, panel. Thank you, join me in thanking the panel. So much wisdom on here, come and find them after. Thank you very much.